Hello, everyone, and welcome to Celix Thursday Live today, episode number 14. My name is Thomas Ropel. I am the CMO of Celix, and I'm incredibly happy to be the host of today's session. And as you all will see, I'm not alone today. Uh, we also have Destiny here from Bet AMS, who joins me today. And Destiny, probably you just would really quickly introduce yourself with a few words. Yeah, definitely. So my name is Destiny Washan. I am co-founder of Better AMS. We are an Amazon advertising agency focusing primarily on scaling Amazon advertising initiatives for seven to nine figure sellers. Um, I've been in the space for four years and this is pretty much anything and everything that I know is Amazon advertising. So super excited to be here. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, that not that many people in the world right now, which, you know, can really state that. Um, Amazon advertising is a thing which we now basically have observed, or I think most of the audience have observed for many years. And it's basically crazy, right? How this, how this really exploded and how many things there are. I remember exactly five years ago, this was such a niche topic. Some first people started to really take it seriously to talk about it. And now five years later, it really seems that this is it, right? This is the thing in the industry and people are really searching for, for anyone that really understands it inside out. So I'm incredibly happy that you're joining us today as we will have a deep dive today into product targeting. Super fun topic. <laughs> cool. So before we, before we start today to, to jump in the key topic of today, um, which basically will be around different formats. So we'll talk about sponsored products. We'll talk about sponsored brands. We also will talk about sponsored display but we'll focus today the conversation on basically product targeting in Amazon. What that means, what are the benefits, what are the downsides? And with the experience of Destiny, we have someone of the global experts in the space that can really bring us light into this. Before we start with the content though, and before we start to go deeper into some of the questions, just again, as always, some housekeeping rules. So I know that some of, of the audience today has been already in the show in the last couple of weeks. But just that everyone already you know, gets a little bit familiar to the, to the idea of the format. Um, this is an active show, which means that if you will have any questions, please always just, just ask them and ask them directly, ask them straight away. Destiny and I will have a very close look at the questions and we will try to answer them throughout the show. And if there will be any questions at the end left, we also will try to still address them today. Well, so it's a fantastic opportunity to really, to really ask questions to uh, one of the best experts in the world on, on this topic. The second thing, this show also will be recorded, right? So you also will see the show later on YouTube and uh, we also will connect all the collateral and everything we talk about today and with the follow-up links in the email that you will receive. So also this is something which we will share. And I think this is probably the most important thing, right, in terms of just some housekeeping and rules. But again, you know, please, everyone, feel free to use the chat, use the Q&A um, as soon as we start. But basically, let's get going. And again, the topic today is sponsored products, display, and also brands, but with a focus on product targeting. So before we jump in into a little bit more detail um, what let's say the best strategies are, what the best practices are, all of this. Destiny, I think for, for the audience, it would just be great to quickly again explain how does actually product targeting work for sponsor products? Yeah, 100%. So I could also hop into a quick screen share and we can walk at what those placements look like on Amazon if that's good with you. I think this would be great. All right, perfect. So sponsored product targeting. This typically shows up on the product detail page. There's many, many different placements, which is what makes product targeting so cool is we can utilize it from a sponsored product auto campaign, a sponsored product manual campaign, sponsored display product targeting and sponsored brands product targeting. So when you hear someone use that term, know that there is many different opportunities to take advantage of it, you know, with or without brand registry. But in general, when you're looking at any product's product detail page, you'll see this placement directly under the buy box and the bullet points. That's typically sponsored display, product targeting, and or DSP. If you scroll a little lower, you now see brands related to this category on Amazon. So this is a fairly new placement. 
This is a sponsored brand's product targeting that's now showing up on the product detail page. Why this is so amazing is it really opens up our targeting and potential with sponsored brands. So again, allows you to use your brand presence and it's a product targeting campaign. And when you scroll even lower, you see sponsored products related to this item. This is a traditional ad placement. Everyone's pretty familiar with this but this can be driven through sponsored product, product targeting, um, manual or auto campaigns, both influence these placements, which makes them really valuable, um, really, really high impression. So all of these within the product detail page are typically driven from some variation of product targeting. Um, within product targeting, you also have category targeting, which is really aligned with product targeting just on a you know, higher level. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about product targeting. Why it's so valuable is you can specifically target ASINs. You're just gonna upload a list of ASINs really similar to what you do with on the keyword level and you're gonna show up here, which is absolute fantastic placement. Great, I mean, this, this already is, um, I think incredibly helpful and I just wanna pause here for a second, right? Because basically what this means, if you nowadays go to the product detail page, you basically see everything, right? So you see sponsored products, you see sponsored display, and you also see sponsored brands all on the same page, right? Which I think is also very important for, for everyone, I think in the audience to realize, because this means that if you use all the three, you basically have also the opportunity to show up three times, right? And really own uh, many, many spaces on, on that page. Um, yeah. And in terms of targeting about keywords and products, we'll go into that in a second. But just probably one step back if we think about the search results. So is this, when we think about product targeting, when we think about the formats, would you say this is mostly related to the product detail pages or are these ads also showing up somewhere else? We typically relate it from the majority to the product detail page. We have seen you know, some crossover, but in general, you're really trying to just show up on the product detail page. Okay, so this is like the main thing and this is where basically also the magic happening. Someone already is looking at a product and then we basically have these, these three spots. And now all of these three, they, in theory, they also can get targeted by keywords, correct? Correct. Okay, so, so basically I think for, for the audience, one of the, I think one of the most important things is that we have three formats, which we'll discuss today, step-by-step, -step, sponsor product, sponsor brands and sponsor display. Um, they show up. In this case, we'll focus today a lot on the on the product listing page. So basically, the page when we see really a product, uh, but you can target them with different ways. You can target them with keywords, as many are familiar in the industry. But you also can target them with product targeting, which basically goes down into a couple of different things that that we can do there. And probably starting then with a sponsor product. So uh, Destiny, if I know think about sponsor products, I want to show up there. Um, how does it work, right? So how can I use sponsor and like product targeting to really show up there? Yeah, 100%. So if you're just starting to dip your toes into sponsor product, product targeting, one of the top recommendations I have is to just pull their search term report. As a lot of people know, if you're scrolling through the search term report, every now and then you're going to see an ASIN that you converted on. And that's always a hot topic in the groups. If you're not familiar, they're like, why is an ASIN showing up in my search term report? And as Thomas mentioned, it's from you know that auto campaign that showed you on a product detail page and you converted from that product detail page on a competitor ASIN. So you have that data of ASINs we've already converted on through auto campaigns or any other placement. Now we wanna take that list and we wanna start a sponsored product, product targeting campaign, targeting all the ASINs that we already have data on. Why this is so important is because it allows you to really control that placement. If you upload this list of ASINs of all of your top competitors, and you target them with a sponsored product, product targeting ad. It allows you to show directly below your top competitors and get a lot of the exposure that they're already getting due to their organic rank. Yeah, and I mean, this is amazing, right? I just want to pause here for a second because I think this is so important, right? Because um, when we think about product targeting, I think, you know, the first question that many, many um, in the audience want to get their head around is which ASINs do I basically choose or which categories do I choose? Do I choose my own products or do I actually choose competitor products or do I choose basically supplement or complementary products? And as far as I just understand what you're saying, you can pretty much do all of this. 
Yeah. All of the above. Great. And, and would you say, um, because I think the, the next question indeed, especially for sponsored products is, how do I figure out these ASINs? And the search term report is probably one of the best ways to figure this out because this is more or less already a proof of concept because you see already certain, certain ASINs which worked in the past and you can then just use them in this case. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think a quick thing to note there is those ASINs are typically driven from your auto campaigns. So everyone's really familiar with running sponsored product auto campaigns. What they're not as familiar with is that those auto campaigns are now broken out into four different targeting groups. So you have close match, loose match, complementary match, and substitute match, all within your auto campaigns. What's really cool about that new additional targeting is two of those match types influence search terms and search term reports, and that's close match and loose match. And then complement and substitute match now influence showing up on the product detail page. So if you really want to get down into the nitty gritty and clean up your targeting, you can separate out your auto campaigns in those two groups. That way you're influencing a constant data collection for search terms. So as mentioned, there is like a hundred different targeting you could do just with product targeting. But if you're dipping your toes in, why not use the data you already have from your auto campaigns? Cause you already know you're converting there. So it's a great way to start with just your search term report data and then start building on that with your competitor targeting, your complementary product targeting, your personal product targeting and everything else. Amazing. Yeah, I just want to recap this because I know that this has also been one of the big questions which we heard in the past. So if someone really wants to start using an auto campaign is one of the best ways to do that, but also ensuring that you use all the four targeting types which you have, break them out between the two keyword related ones and the two product related ones, and then use that data to basically target specifically the products which show up there. Yeah, a hundred percent. Great. And I just see already here, uh, we have a first question from uh, Christine. So thanks and welcome uh, to the show, Christine. So the first question we have here is, would you suggest to always use product targeting? So is that basically any reason why someone should not use product targeting? <laughs> I recommend always using product targeting. Um, they, they perform incredibly well. And if you keep your targeting really small and you know groups of five to six ASINs to target, it's much easier to scale. Some people run into issues if they run a list of like 100 ASINs to target, they're like, oh, it's not performing well. I can't optimize it. But if you start small and scale on that, always run product targeting. Cool. I mean, that's a, that's a very clear statement and I love to hear that. Many times in the show, we always hear like answers like, yeah, it's difficult, you know? We kind of like need to differentiate. But in this case, it really seems to be product targeting basically always makes sense, right? So there's not any reason why someone should not really do this. And I think this also relates to a second question. I see we are ready and you're welcome, Christine. A second question from Kira, which I think goes a little bit into, into this uh, spectrum as well. So the question here is keywords versus product targeting. Which one have you guys seen to perform better? This is a fantastic question. And I'm kind of going to lay it out in terms of the different KPIs. Keywords have much more ad inventory. If you think of what page one search results looks like, there's like nine different sponsor placements you can influence. So in terms of better performance, your keyword targeting is going to make up the majority of kind of your ad inventory. So always run keyword targeting to really focus on scale and to show up on page one. That's where the majority of your traffic is going to be. But product targeting shows up, you know, underneath the competitor's page. So it may get less impressions and less views, but it's a great way to win market share over your competitors. And it's a great way to drive really strong performance in terms of ACOS. We've seen product targeting ACOS be like three to 4% lower than our keyword targeting, just because less people are doing it and less people are doing it well. So always run keywords. They're going to be more, you know, more competitive, but you're going to get more ad inventory, more impressions and page one results. But product targeting allows you to show up on the product detail page, which can be a little bit cheaper and drive better results in terms of like ROAS and ACOS. I mean, that's fantastic, right? I think that's already a, a great summary, I think, of, of that question. So Kira, we hope, we hope this addresses that. But basically, both things make sense. You should use keyword targeting, you should use product targeting, keyword targeting much more to basically reach traffic when people have the search intent and to really address that part 
of the chain and product targeting much more when they're already one step behind that, when they're basically already on the product detail page. And this is when you really can, can ensure that uh, you are there when the decision is happening, someone really wants to buy a product and you're appearing there. If someone now clicks on your ad, um, as you say, it seems that CPCs might even be lower because the competition is not so strong and likely the conversion rate will even be higher because people are one step further down the funnel. So we see already a couple of uh, questions here. So that's great. So thanks everyone. I see that we have already lots of engagement. <laughs> We're just getting started. Um, but I will still continue with the view. So we have Jim Buck, welcome Jim. Um, so this is much more effective than manual targeting with keywords. If we're referencing just, you know, sponsor brands, manual keyword targeting and sponsor brands, manual product targeting, again, it depends on what you're looking for with your goals with effective. Um, effective is in your conversions really good. If you pick the right targeting, yes, you know, it could be lower CPCs, but I think we kind of answered that with the question above in terms of you're going to get lower impressions. Yeah. So I think uh, the, the efficiency play is, um, you know, slightly, this is probably more differentiated, right? But basically I think, you know, if you use both, uh, it definitely seems that you have slightly different use cases here. On the one side, you have more volume. On the other side, you're much closer to the, basically to the buying decision and um, really trying it out, I think makes sense. And we talked about that you can, of course, not select specific ASINs, but for some people, right, this might be a little bit tiresome because you need to research and figure out what are the right products. And now with product targeting, we also have other ways to basically reach inventory. Yes, there, the research that goes behind this is a ton. There is a lot of different strategies you can run, which makes it really interesting because I always tell brands, I don't know how you manage it all from a time perspective. When you know we're looking at just straight effectiveness and ease of management, keyword targeting is probably going to be easier. But that's what makes product targeting so incredible is less people are doing it. Yeah, and if you now think about you know someone uh, wants to use product targeting for sponsor products, um, they have the option also to choose categories, for example, mm -hmm. right, and then refine them. So, so what do you think about that? Yeah, so the way I always kind of mention product targeting, category targeting, sponsored display, things like that, is you really have to kind of envision the consumer funnel. This is really big in the Amazon space. If you ever speak with the reps, they're like, well, what stage of the funnel are you putting them in? But at its core, category targeting is going to be much broader. So if you're running category targeting, I recommend running with lower bids because you're going to be targeting all kinds of different things. If you're in health and beauty and you sell biotin, you're going to be targeting products that aren't exactly related to yours. So make sure you lower your bid so that way you can kind of um, adjust for the constant clicks you're going to be getting. But where category targeting is fantastic is it's data collection. Again, you're going to find things you didn't even think you were going to convert on because Amazon's just casting a wide net. Um, where category targeting can be refined is they do have a refine feature. So if you go and click category targeting, select your category and go to the refine button, it's going to allow you to only target brands or products in the category that have, you know, terrible reviews, or maybe they have a higher price point. You're going to be able to select those filters to make your targeting a little bit cleaner. You can also select if you only want to target specific brands, which makes it really powerful if you're focusing on brand awareness and brand loyalty. Yeah. I mean, you know, just thinking about this, there's so many use cases, right? Just by having like these filters around, I can select basically the brand. I can select the price range. I can select the ratings in any given category. If I just think about all the use cases, you know, that any brand can basically you know, have, for example, you can target for those that have very bad ratings and then you really show up because you know, you have a better rating, right? Or you can basically select products that are more expensive than you because you know that the price will be the key differentiator for you. Or as you say, if you know there's some very key competitor brands, you just wanna say, okay, I wanna compete with these guys. I know that you know, they are in my space and I really wanna win territory. So you can really use this refined feature in a very effective way without doing like tons of research, what are the ASINs, what are this and that, by pretty much a few clicks. Yeah, a hundred percent. And then as you mentioned, we can break that out into even more strategy. So at, at this point it gets, I don't want to say overkill because it's definitely necessary to dominate a category. But when you start, I, we have a question now about like, 
ideal order of priority. That thing really starts to make a difference when you're running 10 to 20 different strategies per ASIN. Something else that's really important is how you name your campaigns. If you start a campaign and you put 12 different categories within it, you're not going to be able to scale that very well because you're going to have to take the average performance and then increase your budget. But if you have one campaign with one strategy, like as you mentioned, maybe you're only targeting competitors that have a higher price point than you, you can really start to scale it and increase your budget as you start seeing success within that campaign. Fantastic. So yeah, let's let's look uh, have another look in questions again, and also thanks everyone. I see you know we get a lot of engagement. I always I always get the impression the more we really talk about a very clear operational, you know, uh, tips and tricks. You know, we just we just see that there's so much interest in these topics. So Gabriel was uh, writing, when you say scale, how exactly do you mean by that? As if you target an ASIN, the search terms is basically giving you back the exact ASIN and search term report. Unlike here, we're targeting where you're able to gain leads from customer search terms, which would be beneficial to rank for the keywords. Unless you choose category when creating product targeting, you will be able to get your ASIN to scale. Just curious how exactly do you scale product targeting when you're targeting an ASIN? This is a fantastic question. So the way we look at it is we break it out into all of these strategies. Um, if you guys are familiar with kind of my methodology, I love auto campaigns because it's evergreen keyword research, but an auto campaign is just a shotgun approach. It is constantly rotating between all of these different positions. So you can't really have clean targeting. So when we're pulling out those ASINs and putting them product targeting, it's like a sniper. We're trying to control exactly how often we show up on that product detail page which you know from a high level seems like it could be really hard to scale but when you start looking at all of these different strategies you can run for product targeting that's where you focus on scale for example one of the things we do is we're going to take our top 10 list of keywords and we're going to type in a list of keyword like bio 10. that's our number one keyword type it in we're going to pull every single asin ranking on page one for bio 10, and we're going to upload it into a product targeting campaign targeting all of those asins why is this beneficial? You know, you don't get juice as much as you do with a keyword targeting. This has been because we're able to piggyback off of all of the traffic, these ASINs who are ranking on page one for Biotin. So even though we're not paying to be at the top of search, which is probably a $7 bid, we're able to show up directly under the product detail page, which means every single consumer that clicks into a listing that is ranking on page one for Biotin is going to see our ad without having to you know pay to be on the search so when you start diving into that specific yeah i think yeah okay cool yeah i think you were breaking up a little bit but i think now we are yeah we're back again awesome i don't know what happened there <laughs> yeah, yeah no i think there were just some some technical lag issues but i think we are back there but i think um the majority i think was uh was pretty much clear so basically um, yeah, to answer your question, Gabriel, I think um, in terms of scale, um, of course, you need to figure out how to get more and more ASINs. And, and as Destiny pointed out, auto campaigns are one of the best ways to actually do this if you use them in a strategic way. And there are also other ways to do this, as with this fantastic example, right? Just looking at some of the top keywords, checking the top 10 results, selecting those ASINs. So even if you don't show up at the search results page, you basically show up at the product listing page, which is even one step below, right? And which I think is a, is a great strategy. So I hope that this, this helped a little bit on that point. We just will take another question. And Kira is asking, if everyone does it, then it would become more competitive. And at some point it would be spending more or less returns while investing in keyword search would make more sense, right? So what do you think about that destiny? I mean, that philosophy can also be applied to keywords in search. If anything, keyword in search is going to be more competitive because you don't have to have brand registry to run it and it shows up more like an organic listing. So in order to kind of more fairly answer that, Amazon's diversifying ad types. We've seen that in the last six months, especially sponsored brands now shows up in like 10x more placements. We now have video in search. So yes, everything's going to get more competitive, even more so now that everyone's switching their brick and mortar budgets to online. Competition is always going to happen, no matter what placement it is. We've seen it even on the keyword side of things. CPCs have increased greatly over the last eight years. 
So it's less about focusing on competition per ad type and more about focusing on what one's specifically doing well for you now. Amazon gives us the data almost immediately other than attribution. So you can easily start a campaign, wait seven to 14 days, see how it's doing, and then compare it to your keyword search. If your keyword search is doing better, always focus on scaling that, but use the data to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think, I hope this, this uh, answers uh, the question, but yeah, I think um, we, we basically fully agree with this assessment. There's just so much happening. And yeah, of course, you know, of course some things will be more expensive, right? And I think right now, probably one of the, the best things that anyone can do is just to be at the top of anything that launches, right? Because this is the moment where people are not using it that much, right? And keywords, now everyone uses keywords. Everyone is aware of keywords. Everyone knows the top 10 keywords. Everyone shows up there. But being really, really smart about how to then dominate the product listing page or using new formats is also definitely something which can be um, now a competitive advantage. And for the time being, you know, at some point it might not be anymore, but then other three things will launch, right? Because one thing that we've seen is that Amazon doesn't sleep, right? They take this topic incredibly seriously. And if uh, one thing that we have been impressed a lot in the last few years is just how much they're launching and how quickly they're iterating and it's uh, really not getting boring. So I, I think there always will be, will be new opportunities, but yeah, of course, um, a reasonable and good question, Akira. And then we have uh, Reinish who, who asked, uh, hopefully I pronounced his name correctly, um, who basically asked the question, in blood pressure monitor category, I am not able to run display ads, so how to target product targeting so that my product will display just below the bullet points, just like display ads? What adjustments shall I do in placement? How to target that ad? That's a great question. So typically what we recommend is running product targeting under sponsor brands and with sponsor products. Now, if it's high competition, you're probably not going to show up directly below the buy box, but you are still going to show up, you know, below, below the product detail page. A workaround is to see if you can get approved for DSP. So DSP kind of has some misconceptions because Amazon usually charges $35,000 minimum to spend. But if you work with a DSP partner provider, you can run DSP ads for a minimum of like five to 10,000 a month. And their approvals are a little bit different than sponsored display. And that's how you know you are going to win that placement directly below the buy box. So either look at DSP or just invest really heavily in your sponsor product, product targeting and sponsor brand product targeting to include it's close to that placement. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think, you know, of course, there's still some things which um, are great. To, to be there right but there are also so many alternatives just pretty much uh, below it where i think we can appear much easier and then we had the question from roland uh, roland was asking about the priority i think we addressed this already so so thanks for that and then johannes welcome back johannes um johannes asked the question do you guys suggest a happy range uh, for number of asins to target in one campaign i know Celix likes 100 or less yeah, Celix actually always suggests that per campaign it should be, you know, not too many and not, you know, too low. So basically we always say 10 to 100 is more or less a, a good range. Um, if there are more than that you don't want to miss out on, do you just run two or three separate campaigns? So what is your thinking destiny about campaign structure? How many, how many products would you basically suggest should be in one campaign or one ad group? An extremely similar strategy. Now, the way I kind of like to explain it is if you have a really small budget, you need to be much more concise with your targeting because you're really going to see effect if you're targeting a hundred different products and they all get 10 clicks that adds up really, really quickly. So if you're running with a really small budget, start really small with, you know, two to three campaigns, maybe targeting 10 ASINs. Um, just so that way you can scale them a little bit better. So if one of them starts doing really, really well, you can go ahead and increase your budget. But if you have a hundred products that you're targeting and you don't have a lot of spend, that becomes an issue just because it's more complex distributing, distributing your like 10 to $20 across a hundred different products. So that's kind of the way I always make recommendations, but we recommend very small batches similar to that. Yeah. And uh, again, I think hopefully this, this helps uh, Johannes. And I think the other thing, which we normally always also suggest in this space, you know, not more than 100 because you know then you're kind of like losing a little bit of control but less than 10 also might really limit limit your reach but especially if you use product targeting the same principles apply as with keyword targeting so really trying to group 
the right things in basically any group or campaign. Um, just that also it makes it much easier for you then to elevate results. We already touched on a couple of strategies. Product targeting is also fantastic for any sophisticated and more, let's say, advanced strategies in this space. But even for the simple ones, it always makes sense to group every strategy in one campaign. Right? So if you target competitor products or competitive products, right, there should be rather one campaign and ad group and the other one focuses on another use case. Yeah. So it, it depends on a, a few factors, but basically yeah, the same principles apply. Okay, we still have a couple of questions. Um, so let's quickly jump into them before we uh, continue with some other topics. I, I know that uh, we also wanted to discuss a little bit more sponsor brands and display, but I just want to ensure you all know STL, we really try to make it as interactive as possible. This show is for you. So we really try to take every, every question incredibly seriously and to ensure that all of them can be answered properly. So in that spirit, Abraham um, is asking, is there a report for sponsored display where you can see converting ASINs when targeting categories? There is not within Advertising Console. I believe there may be something rolled out throughout the API. Thomas, do you know the API is allowing it? Like it was a new, new rollout, if it is. Yeah, I don't think it's public yet, yeah. yeah. So no, no reporting. Okay which is why small batches make a ton of sense and are much better. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I think definitely something which probably at some time point will come up, right? But for now, we unfortunately don't have this. Um, Isabella was asking, can you use negative ASIN search terms for auto campaigns? No, is the easiest answer. You cannot directly negate ASINs. Now, there are some workarounds that kind of go around in the group that work really well, and it's basically pulling out maybe the key points in the title. So maybe negating the on will correlate negating like key strands of search terms that are very specific to the ASIN you're showing up for. Um, that's a way. And if you also have your auto campaigns broken out into the four different targeting groups, you can potentially see if maybe, you know, your substitutes is where this ASIN is populating, lower your bid on the substitutes to kind of cut off that traffic, but no direct way to negate ASINs. Okay. And I think this also connects to the question, which Gabriel is asking. So understood on your methodology and approach. Thanks. So basically you're utilizing auto targeting to gain your leads and stick it into the product targeting to scale. The downside for auto campaigns is that we aren't able to block out the ASINs unlike keywords to gain individual control on ASINs. Is there such a thing as ASIN targeting cannibalizing each other in your opinion? This is a very controversial strategy and opinion in general when you start talking about negating from an auto campaign to a manual campaign. We don't run that strategy in any sense so if you do, I'm probably not going to give you the best advice to align with what you're already doing, but at its core, no. Um, cannibalization is not something that will happen here because there are so many different placements on the product detail page you can populate. It's not like a headline search ad where you're only focusing on that top of search placement. You don't want to run 20 campaigns targeting the exact same placement because it's one placement. But when you look at sponsored products and, you know, sponsored product, product targeting on the product detail page, there's, you know, 10 to 15 different placements your ad can show up on. So you're probably not buying for the same position. It won't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's, that's also a fantastic uh, bridge to now basically uh, the, the second focus topic of today, right? Because I think now we talked a lot about product targeting, how it works. It also works mostly with sponsored products. And I think, you know, Gabriel, you, you really summarized it up as well. You know, I could have not summarized it better. I think, uh, you know, just, just using auto campaigns, using that in order to, to get the leads and then to target them specifically. But now let's talk also again about the other formats, you know, coming back to where we started the show. So we talked about sponsored products, but let's say two of the newer things in the industry um, are sponsored brands and also sponsor display. And for these two formats, Basically, many, many advertisers right now are not really thinking how to use product targeting for them. So let's probably start with sponsored brands. So when you think about sponsored brands, you've shown this in the Coca-Cola example. Um, how do you think about strategies for sponsored brands and product targeting? Do they work the same way as with sponsored products or are there any differences? 
The biggest thing I can kind of start off with is don't overcomplicate sponsored brands. That's kind of just a very generalized statement. But again, you have the data from sponsored products, from auto campaigns, just reinvest in it. What's really cool about sponsored brands is you can now line up your copy to go with that. Oh, one second. Yeah. Alexa, pause. My Alexa picked up on something I just said. Let's see. That's, that's, that's Alexa. I wasn't just listening. Yeah, we can have a whole conversation about that. Yeah. At its core, sponsors are very similar. It's still a placement, you know, below the product detail base have the ability to copy. So with that ability to write copy, take advantage of it. Don't just put, you know, a cheesy slogan from your brand. Write something with a competitive advantage, but use it in the exact same way. You're still uploading a list of products to Target, but now you have the opportunity to influence that imagery. So whether that's your logo, whether it's a lifestyle image in that placement, and then you have the ability to write copy, and you can drive to either your store page or a landing page. So that's where it becomes much more valuable is if you have a full line of products that you want to advertise and really show you have market domination over. Yeah, and I think, you know, with, with that in mind, right? So when, when many advertisers think about sponsored brands, right? They obviously think about brands, they think about their own brand, they think about, okay, I have my store, I have here basically my product line. Um, in, that, in that spirit, right? So we, we saw where the ad is showing up would you now say that different strategies make more sense for sponsored brands versus sponsored products? Or would you basically say the same strategies apply? It's just more or less different, different um, ad format on the product listing page. Where I think it makes a difference is if you do have like an incredible store page and you're really starting to push brand awareness and that's kind of where you want to differentiate yourself is with your brand. Now, if you're just a seller with a smaller group of products, you can run the exact same strategy. You can drive to a landing page. You just now have the ability to write copy. If anything, it's more so of an advantage for the people who have the ability to compete with brand awareness. Um, a kind of a good example is if you have a full line of supplements, you can target other competitors that have a full line of supplements and drive them to a page with all of your supplements. Maybe it's men's supplements. You can showcase that full line of men's supplements look at all of our products and potentially purchase more than one. Um, but if you have one or two supplements, you don't want to drive them to that store page. That's just going to confuse them. You can focus on still driving them to a landing page now that you have that ability and showcasing both of your items rather than just a single ace and landing page. Yeah, yeah no, I think that's, uh, that's a great way to think about it. And um, so if I now think about the performance, right? Because also many people, when they think about, okay, I have few sponsor products, I have few sponsor brands, and we basically saw they're almost showing up next to each other. Um, how would be your experience in terms of profitability, in terms of performance? Would you say both work the same way? Would you say one works better than the others? How would you think about it in terms of CPCs, conversion rates, and ACOS? So I kind of want to start by saying that sponsored brands and sponsored products we see typically perform within a 5% ACOS of each other. And that's definitely a misconception we see in the area for smaller brands because sponsored brands are just more complex. So it's harder for people to get them to perform better. With that being said, when you're looking at the sponsor brands product targeting, it's pretty close to the same ACOS um, if you're targeting correctly but we typically see sellers not running them as concisely. So a higher ACOS if you're, you know, going for broader targeting. So I would say sponsored products, product targeting has more impressions, um, more clicks and a higher conversion rate because it's directly below the buy box and driving to a single ASIN. So they're clicking exactly on the checkout page, but with sponsor brands, product targeting, if you're driving them to a store page, you're going to see a drop in conversion and things like that because they're kind of overwhelmed with more products, which mm -hmm. is fantastic if you're driving brand awareness and trying to have multiple purchases, but sponsor yeah. products, product targeting probably performs better on a KPI perspective. Yeah. And I think that's, that's something which is also fantastic insight. I think, you know, many think about sponsor products and sponsor brands just from a direct ROI perspective, you know, which performs better. But I think whenever we think about it, we also need to understand the brand effect, share voice. You basically send them out to your store. They basically get familiar with your brand. They see other products that you have. And all of this can have also much more lasting effect. 
it probably doesn't lead directly to a conversion, right? But kind of like it can lead to many, many more conversions down the road, which we all want to have. And uh, Gabriel, yes, if, thank you for this feedback, right? So again, please always share and keep feedback coming. Everything we're discussing here, if you think, you know, this makes sense, let us know. If you think it doesn't make sense, let us know, right? <laughs> we, we really try to, to keep it as relevant as possible, knowing that there are thousands of topics which can, really can, can touch on. But in the interest of time, we talked now a little bit about sponsor brands. We started with sponsor products, but then there's also the third big one, right? Sponsor display, which now yeah. also one more people get their head around. And I don't think that many, many people have so far thought about sponsor display in connection with product targeting. How, how, how does that work? So sponsor display is incredible. It's definitely the new shiny object but it's extremely overwhelming because there's multiple targeting types. At its core, what we're focusing on is sponsored display product targeting, which is kind of the highest intent targeting that you can have. Um, it's really, really clean, really concise. Again, it's the exact same strategy as everything else we're talking about. You just upload a list of ASINs and you show up directly under the buy box. So sponsor display product targeting is actually not new to Amazon advertising. It's been rolled out since 2017, but it was only available for vendors. So we have the data to prove that it's absolutely incredible. It's probably one of the lowest ACOS ad types when you're just looking at kind of holistic attribution. It does extremely well, shows up directly under the buy box. It's a great way to win market share. And now it's finally available for sellers. So this is the one ad type I would highly recommend you jump on. This is probably the highest priority ad type because it does incredible. Uh, it's amazing. But if you're just looking at sponsored display as a whole, you're going to see audience targeting, which breaks out into views and searches and things like that. And those are exactly what Thomas is talking about. That's when you really need to know your share of voice and you know, your goals because they're much higher, much more top of the funnel. Great. Yeah. And Jay, first of all, thanks so much for this, for this feedback. You know, again, we, we love to hear any feedback, but we especially love to hear great feedback. And um, to your question, Jay, I think, you know, directly connected here, can everyone use product targeting and sponsor display? Is this now available to everyone? Are there any limitations? How does it work? Yeah, it's a brand registry requirement, but I will say we see much more strict regulations around sponsored display. You'll have products that you have no idea why they're not eligible. Um, they do look at what's in your backend and what's in your listing. So where we've seen this is in the supplement category. All of our products will be available, but one, even though it's very similar and maybe it has weight loss in the web listing or something like that, that flagged it. Now you can get around that potentially if you reach out to your Amazon rep, they can possibly tell you why it has been restricted and you can make the change to get it opened up or you can run DSP again, which is a very similar placement. Okay, cool. But if I now again, you know, think about it from a logical perspective, we have sponsored display, which basically looks at the audience. We have now product targeting, which looks at the product. So from a targeting perspective, we combine both or how does it exactly work in the, in the in practice? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it also kind of relates to a few of the other questions that are in the group. We, we run both because we're on pretty maximized budgets. So product targeting, highest level of intent, you're really driving the consumers to purchase your product. But we also wanna run some of the other assets because they're on and off the platform when you get into audience targeting, some of them are CPM based. What you're doing is making people more aware of your brand. So if you're a bigger seller and you're really trying to compete in that area, Run the other ones with just really, really low budgets in the background so that way you can kind of gain data and start optimizing over time. But as for product targeting, it's going to run at a fantastic ACOS if it's ran well. So you can really focus on scaling it, which also kind of dives into a quick question. How do you maximize and really focus on scaling those ASINs? It's still bids that are kind of the core driver. So if you're not getting impressions on a large list of ASINs, I would increase your bids. Um, that's going to be kind of the number one lever you can pull to get more impressions with any of your targeting types. Cool. And I think this was related to the question of Johannes, right? So hopefully Johannes, this, yes. this addresses it. And then we have um, Abraham, uh, we sponsor display. Do you place all variations in one campaign or creating separate campaigns per listing and target one another? So, so how would you approach this structure question here? 
two things there. Um, one, we focus on one ASIN just so that way we can personally optimize and scale it better. And we know exactly how that ASIN is performing. As mentioned above, sponsored display reporting is very poor. We don't get an advertised product report. So we want to have one ASIN in it so we know exactly how that ASIN is performing. Um, to build off that question, we do target our ASINs against our other ASINs. That's a great defensive strategy to run. Um, Thomas mentioned it earlier. One, you can showcase your other products if they're not in a parent-child relationship. Also, you're gonna defend that placement. So if we have one blue variation and one green variation, we're gonna target our green variation with our blue variation. So our consumer can see our full product line and we don't have a competitor bidding on that placement because we are. Yes, it's defensive ad technique, but it's a great way to protect that market share and gain new market share. Great. Yeah. So I think, you know, slowly we see how many strategies there are. I think we can have a full couple of episodes, right? You will be talking yeah, about Yeah, I kind of feel bad. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it's amazing because I think it also shows um, how many things you can do, right? So basically when we think about, we think about three formats, we think about different targeting types, just by these two combined, how many use cases there already are. I think this is, this is uh, incredibly powerful to understand. And Jay, your question around the ideal budget split between the three mentioned categories. Um, not sure if categories now refers here to basically sponsor products, brands, and display. I would guess so. So, so Destiny, if you, if you think about this, so how would you think, you know, from your personal experience, how do you roughly split the budget between these three formats? I would recommend putting the majority of your budget to sponsored display product targeting targeting a small list of ASINs. That's typically going to be the best placement because it's the closest to the product. It's right under the bullet points and the buy box. Performs incredibly well with the correct targeting. Um, I would probably go next to sponsored products, product targeting, just because these perform really well and you get quite a few placements. And then the third one, I would do sponsored brands, product targeting, which if you have an amazing brand and amazing store page, you want to showcase, give it more budget. If not, then sponsor brands probably isn't the best asset to use in all the product targeting ranges. Fantastic. I think this was a great and a short answer. I hope Jay, this was helpful. I'm jumping quickly to the Q&A because we also have a Q&A, which not everyone I think is seeing, but we are. So Reinish, I think your question we already want, we addressed, but we had a question from Steve. So Steve said, uh, I have 22 ASINs of my own that I want to target on my other ASINs pages to push off competitors targeting on my ASINs. One campaign per ASIN or one campaign for all ASINs, uh, how best to do this, please? So there's two different scenarios to look at here. Let's say you have 22 t-shirts. They're all extremely similar. So what you can do is have one ASIN targeting all 22 of your ASINs just to defend that placement. If you want to get really, really particular, then you can have multiple ASINs targeting 22 ASINs and multiple campaigns. And that works because all the products are extremely similar. Let's say you're in a different product line and maybe you have like snorkel gear and skiing gear. You probably don't want to target those across each other because there's not a lot of correlation. If someone's looking at skiing gear they're probably not going to buy snorkel gear. So if you have 22 kind of ASINs that are differentiated, I probably would look at cleaner targeting and have like 10 campaigns that are showing only the aligned products. Yeah, perfect. Fantastic. Um, Steve, I hope this addresses your question, but that's also basically the, the way that we always think about it, grouping things, you know, that make sense. So in this <laughs> case, really where you have uh, pretty much, you know, comparable products, comparable ASINs, comparable category, use cases and it also makes it much better for you in the end to really um, analyze it right because the dynamics can be very very different from every product or category to each other uh, then we had another question also here in the Q&A which I just want to quickly address uh, Reinish uh, was asking um, how to stop ASINs in auto ads that are not converting yeah, this is where you really want to look at separating out your auto campaigns so you can control what targeting type is maybe hemorrhaging spend for you and looking at the, uh, oh, sorry, and looking at negating the core pieces of the title within that. Perfect. 
Okay, so I see time flies by with so many questions, but I mean, that's, that's cool, that's great. And um, again, I just, I just want to, to reiterate that um, these are all topics which, which I think are um, incredibly insightful. And um, also for everyone that is listening, first of all, thanks so much for also the feedback, Abraham. And um, we will come back to your question in a second. But uh, as you also notice, this show, we go also very deep into specific parts, right? I mean, uh, probably some thought it's just about product targeting, right? But now basically, uh, obviously, it's not just product targeting. There's so many use cases and so many formats. And uh, they quickly open up to a big variety of, of opportunities. And this is also something which we will also go in the future much deeper into. But now we just want to also ensure, because we are slowly unconscious of time, uh, ensuring that we have everything covered here. Steve, our pleasure. Abraham was asking, um, so is it only with sponsored display you have put one ASIN per campaign or with product targeting as well? PS, very informative show is. I'm not 100% sure if you're referring to the ASINs we're targeting or the ASINs we're advertising. In all three, we typically only advertise one ASIN per campaign. So only one of our ASINs is showing. So that way we can really control, you know, the exposure and the conversion of that one ASIN. Now for targeting is where we look at doing, you know, 10 to 100, depending on what we're targeting. The best way to think about it is targeting by strategy that Thomas mentioned. Top competitors, one campaign, targeting all the top competitors. Products that are close to ours, one campaign. Products that have a worse review count, one campaign. But only advertising one ASIN within those campaigns. Perfect. All right. I think, I think we have now many, many questions covered and there's still okay. new ones coming in. So we still will try to get this one before I will wrap up the show as we're slowly coming to an end. But Robin was asking, would you recommend using main categories for category targeting or rather very specific categories? Why not both? is typically my recommendation. Now, again, we all have a certain amount of spend. We need to evenly distribute across. But just know when you're doing main category targeting, it's much more top of the funnel and much broader. So you're probably not going to convert as well, which doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means it's achieving different goals. You're collecting data, you're driving brand awareness. So always know like the more clicks that you're getting, just lower your bid. So category targeting, extremely broad, start with a much lower bid. Now, if you're getting very specific into category targeting, you're probably going to convert much better. So you can start with a little bit more of an aggressive bit and you can always optimize after you get these launched. So in this scenario with having a limited budget, I would start with much more refined specific categories because you can always scale up as you go. Like Amazon gives you this data. So start small, figure out what's working. And if you're absolutely crushing your specific category and you want to go a little bit broader, just start a new campaign with broader targeting. Again, you can start with a $3 a day budget and a 70 cent bid if you want, see what happens. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Destiny, Robin. And yes, I think, you know, the problem with limited budget, uh, many have, <laughs> so it's not, uh, you're not the only one. I think uh, there are many out there which uh, have the same issue. And yes, we always need to, to make conscious decisions uh, how to start and how to utilize our budget. And basically as Destiny is saying, to learn quickly. And in these kind of scenarios, better start small and then grow, then probably the other way around if you're really tight on budget. Cool. Okay, we have uh, five minutes left before I will wrap up the show. I know that we have the general tip section also for the end, uh, Destiny. Do you want to probably summarize up what would be the top things for anyone in the show that now really wants to start with um, product targeting? What should they do? Whew, top tips. <laughs> I'm going to say start small. If you have a limited budget and you're diving into a new ad type, one of the worst things you can do is be crazy aggressive up front because it's going to scare you away. If anything, start with really low bids. It does not hurt to start with a 10 cent bid on a product targeting. And if you don't get any impressions, just increase your bid by 10 cents. Keep increasing it until you find that sweet spot. Start with small groups of targeting that are very specific. Find one competitor and you're like, hey, I want to target them. I have a better price point. Upload just that one ASIN and see what happens. Where people mess up is they try to cast a really, really wide net and get a ton of clicks up front and then they think it performs terribly. 
when in reality, they're trying to collect data against 100 different ACEs, which adds up really quick. So for all of these targeting types, know your goals and try to align your strategy with those goals and start small. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Destiny. It was a great session. It was really, really incredibly informative. And um, yeah, we're almost at the end. So uh, what we always do, and for those of you that already attended some of the last shows, one of the most important things of uh, Silix Thursday Live is your feedback. So I will quickly open up the survey, right, very quickly, which you will now see in front of you. And we're always asking this at the end of every show. And the reason is we really want to understand how do you like the show and what you want to hear about in the future. This show is for you. So your feedback is key. And everyone that has attended the shows in the past, uh, hopefully, uh, can uh, confirm uh, that that we really take this all seriously. That's also the reason why we're talking today about product targeting, right, with Destiny, because this was one of the things we also heard. There's lots of interest in the in the industry and not many, many questions around this topic. And so we wanted to have a deeper session on this today. So I see some first results are coming in. Take your time. I will keep it open for another for another minute or two. And while I give you guys some time, also some last things um, from, from Celix around all of this. So I will quickly share my screen, just that you also see basically, it's always the best possible way to show what we're talking about. So if you go to the Celix page, um, you will see a couple of things, you know, which most of you are probably familiar with, but what I really want to highlight is uh, this one here, right? So basically the Amazon Advertising Grader if you click on this, I know some of you probably already have done this, but this is something which we are piloting right now. It's a, a report which you will get in a few hours and which will tell you more or less um, exactly where, where the key challenges and problems are in your account. This is still a pilot, right? But basically you will get a PDF report that looks like this and um, it will give you some first guidance on some of the topics which we also touched on today where you basically will see what you can do, what you should not do, and how you should probably think about things. Um, it's in early days, right? So we're now just trying to get all of the information, also everything that we hear and talk about in a very automated and direct way. So if you have any thoughts about, you know, what you can do and where potentials are on your account, please, please feel free to try this out. It's something which is in a pilot phase. We're changing it all the time. We are evolving this, and we're also working with thought leaders also like Destiny to really ensure that, that this is really, really also helpful to ensure that um, everyone in the industry can be as successful as possible with advertising. Because we really believe this is something, and this is for free, I think I forget to mention this, this is for free. Um, and I think this is just very important to, to also understand that our own belief here is that advertising is still in the early days when it comes to Amazon. There's so many things happening, there's so many opportunities and we really think that um, it's a huge opportunity for everyone, right? So really educating all of you, I think, is a, is a fantastic thing because we're still day number one, as Amazon would say, and there are, there are so many things um, ahead of us. Um, last but not least, you will find the show. I know we covered many topics, so you will get the show also on YouTube. You will get some links on this in the follow-up email. If you have any questions, never hesitate to reach out. You can reach out always to us. Destiny, what's the best way to reach you? Yeah, definitely check out LinkedIn, Facebook. I post content pretty much every single day on all of the topics we're talking about. Um, I try to post strategies every single day that can help. Similar to Thomas, you know, it's the early days. Like, we just want to see everyone succeed. There's, a, there's enough potential for everyone out there. So feel free to follow me there, add me. Um, and if you ever want to reach out to us, Better AMS, feel free to go to betterams.com and it'll allow you to book a call directly on my calendar. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Destiny. And uh, yeah, Molly, to, to the last question. Um, yes, we haven't forgotten sponsor brands, right? Also in the greater. So it's definitely something which is on the roadmap. It's not live yet, as you probably have seen in the latest version, but it's definitely something which we are working on as we speak, right? So this will also come very soon. Um, but for now, I really want to, to close the show again. You can follow us on any of the social channels, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever you like, right? We will also have the show posted everywhere. 
Um, you can, again, rewatch it. If you have any questions, reach out. But for now, I really want to give a big thanks to Destiny. It has been an incredible show, incredible, a huge amount of information. And I want to say a big thank you to everyone who joined the show. Great questions. We hope this was helpful. And we wish everyone a fantastic morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, and a fantastic day. Bye, everyone.